Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the 2018 Jack Mullen Lecture, which is sponsored by the Department of Economics at UMBC, but also the Social Sciences Forum. The Mullen Lecture brings prominent economists to UMBC to speak on significant economic policy issues. Uh, this is now, we've had the Mullen Lecture now for about 20 years, um, and lets you think that uh, economists are always boring and uh, uninteresting topics. Our, our first Mullen Lecture was actually on the future of Social Security. Uh, and our speaker was Edward Gramley, who can actually Somebody chose that occasion to actually burn their social security card. Uh, so raises issues. Hopefully we're not gonna have that happen with this, but we also had, I think, a very important policy topic and, and uh, a very exciting, uh, important speaker, uh, who is uh, Cecilia Rouse, Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, and also the Katzman Ernst Professor in Economics and Education. Uh, and she's also a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton. So she's uh, chosen a policy issue, I think it's fair to say it's important to all of us here, namely the future of American higher education. And in speaking on this topic, not only does she bring stellar academic credentials, but also very substantial policy and administrative experience on this topic. So on the academic side, Dean Rouse completed both her undergraduate degree and doctorate in economics at Harvard University. She then joined the faculty at Princeton where her fields of specialty have been labor economics and the economics of education. She has authored numerous important articles in those fields. So some of the topics uh, that they cover include the economic benefit of community college attendance, the impact of Milwaukee's pro private school voucher program on student achievement, the effect of student loan debt on college graduates' career choices, and the impact of computer-assisted instruction on students' performance on, in reading and mathematics. And one of her most featured articles is titled Orchestrating Impartiality, the Impact of Blind Auditions on Female Musicians, which documented how the shift of US orchestras to a system of blind auditions, whereby the auditioning musician was only heard but not seen by the audition committee, led to an increase in female musicians uh, winning these auditions. And she actually shared with us before, she actually spent time actually sitting in on some of these auditions with audition committees to sort of get background in all this. Uh, so she's had a very, uh, I think, uh, written on a, a very rich array of, of research topics. She's also served as editor of the journal of Labor Economics and of the journal Future of Children. So this is her academic background. She's also had significant policy experience in Washington. She served on the National Economic Council for the Clinton Administration during 1998 to 99, and she was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors for the Obama Administration from 2009 to 2011. Since 2013, she has been dean of the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. And I also want to mention, by having her, we're continuing with sort of a mini tradition with the uh, Mullen Lecture. Uh, we've had two previous recipients who have won the Carolyn Shaw Bell Award uh, for um, significant contributions to furthering the status of women in the economics profession. And it turns out that Dean, Rice, Dean Rouse was recipient of the 2016 Carolyn Shaw Bell Award. So we're glad to continue that tradition uh, uh, with, our, with our lecture. Um, so anyway, I'm very pleased to turn the podium over to Dean Rouse. I'm trying to think, is, should we burn student loans? We don't want to burn diplomas, at least I don't, I don't think so, but maybe we can decide that at the end of the talk. Uh, so um, it really is a pleasure to be here on this warm, a little humid day. Um, so yes, OK, went for the somewhat catchy title, mostly to just get attention. Um, but the, um, the reality is that the, the motivation behind this talk, which in some ways is going to end up being kind of a traditional economics talk about what do we think are the costs and benefits and the return to, uh, to schooling. Uh, but I, I got into it and I came into this topic a little differently this year um, because it, it, everywhere I go and as I talk to other leaders in higher education, there is this constant worry in the halls that higher education is in crisis. Uh, so these are a few actual headlines. So if you read the headlines, people are writing about edu you know, higher education at a crossroads, crisis, is there a future? We have to rethink things uh, dramatically. Uh, 
something that really got the attention of higher ed leaders uh, is recent polling. So this comes out in 2000, this is from 2018. Pew had done an earlier version. So this was the views on the effect of colleges and universities on the country. Um, so the first thing you'll notice is that Republicans have always been a little less positive than Democrats. But there's this eye-popping, only 36% of those who identify as Republican believe that colleges and universities are having um, a positive effect on this country. That's a really small percentage and uh, gets one's attention. We could dismiss that to partisanship. OK, so something's going on. But uh, this uh, is a little harder to ignore. So this was in response to the question of whether higher education is uh, in the United States is generally going in the wrong direction. OK, so we've already seen that those who identify as Republican are less favorable. But look at this. More than half of Democrats as well say that uh, the US uh, colleges and universities are headed in the wrong direction. Uh, if you put the two together, on average, that's 61% of those who responded to the surveys. So you see people in the halls saying, should we panic? Should we not? OK, these are only based on polls you know, with, what, 1,000 respondents. And we all know the recent evidence that polling is getting less reliable. OK, we're not going to worry about it. Ooh, but Congress just passed a tax on the endowments of the wealthiest 30 universities in this country. So if you think that when people put their actions are, are loud, speak louder than words, you put their money where your mouth is, um, maybe there's something to be concerned about. So that's how I got into this. And I, so I wanted to better understand what, what lies beneath this agita. So the first thing I did is looking at within the same poll is, OK, why are the respondents saying that they are concerned that our uh, higher education system heads in the wrong direction? So the black pencils are those who are, uh, identify Republican. Uh, the yellow ones are Democrats. And so the first two explanations are too much concern about protecting students from views uh, that they might find offensive. Uh, the second one about professors bringing political and social views into the classroom. So clearly, there's a big partisan divide here. I suspect this is part of what underlies some of the partisanship. And because I am a professor of economics and not political science, I'm not going to say as much about this. Um, uh, and I'm actually uh, being, being a little short. I've actually been, to the extent that I have time to do new research, I've actually been doing a little bit of research on ideological diversity and its value in the classroom. We can talk a little bit more about that at the very end during Q&A if we have time. Uh, but in this talk, I, the talk was getting too long. So I decided to focus on the second two, which as an economist goes to the very heart and guts of why many of you are here and why many of us believe so strongly in higher education, which is that you can see that it, for, both, uh, for both explanations, one, that students are not getting the skills they need to succeed in the workplace, and two, high tuition costs, so we have the cost and potentially the benefit. We have both Democrats and Republicans, uh, a majority of which are saying that uh, we're sort of on the losing side of this proposition. If you put it all together, uh, whether the views on whether college is a good investment, only 52% responded that uh, college education is still the best investment for people who want to get ahead and succeed. And a whopping 46% said that college education is a questionable investment because of high student loans and limited job opportunities. Ugh. Right? This is right. This goes right to the gut of what many of us have believed about college. And if we go back, since this is an economics lecture, so if we go back to the Becker models and thinking about college as uh, and higher education as an investment in human capital, where we do believe, yes, there are costs up front, but that the benefits outweigh those costs. Um, and that has been a you know, cornerstone of our thinking for decades. Um, I, I was very surprised to see that this number was so low. And I just wanted to say, do I need to rethink how I'm thinking about this? Has there been some shifts in the labor market and in the cost of college that I haven't really been paying attention to? So what might be going on here? So what I want to do in the talk today is, one, just go back over. So what are the costs of attendance? How have those changed in recent years? Um, you know, there's a lot of concern about student loans. So let's get a little bit under the hood there. There could we could do an entire six lectures on student loans. So this will just be an entire six slides on student loans. Obviously, scratching the surface. 
Um, then consider the economic benefit of attending college, both to the individual and then to society, and to put it together and to say, is it really worth it? OK, so that's, that's where I'm headed. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, so we're sitting here in a, one of the major public institutions in this country. Um, but I just want to make sure we understand the landscape uh, for higher ed. So at the very top, we have our newcomers, the for-profits. Uh, you can see back in 2000s, they only comprised about two, under 2% 2 of the student population. These are all students, undergraduate, graduate, part-time, full-time, uh, about 2%. But that had over doubled uh, to almost 5% by 27, 2016. Katz and Golden uh, and Jonathan Demi did some work uh, where they actually estimated between about 2000 and 2009 that in increased enrollments in for-profit institutions account for about a third of the gross of post-secondary enrollments. So they're the newcomers on the block. Uh, and um, you, you're not going to hear me say many nice things about them aside from that uh, going forward um, because I think they really are, uh, they're a different beast, but they are, I think, complicating some of our overall understanding about the costs and benefits of, um, of the post-secondary education. Uh, my favorites are community colleges. I'm from California really almost the home of the community college, Illinois technically is, but we perfected it. Um, and uh, so, um, so what you can see is that it, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, or you know, 2000s, about 39% of enrollment were in um, two-year colleges. Today it's about 31%. Uh, it's a little deceiving, it says public and private. 96, 95, 96% of two-year colleges are public, so they're really community colleges. Another 3% are, are, are for-profit, and the remaining are private. So really, the two-year colleges are overwhelmingly community colleges um, when we think about them. If we were to have limited this to uh, undergraduate uh, students, obviously, they'd be a much bigger proportion of undergraduate enrollment. Uh, you can see the growth over the, the, the last 16 years or so has been in the four-year public institutions, and that there's been almost no change in the a uh, fraction of students, a percentage of students that are in four-year um, not-for-profits. Uh, so that's just so we have a shared understanding of where our students are situated. So let's start with, I'm going to start on the cost side and then move to the benefit side. So when we start with costs, this is a graph that shows um, published tuition. So if we were buying a car, we would call this the sticker price. Uh, so the published tuition and fees over time from 2000 to 2017. The top line is the tuition and fees at not-for-profit four-year institutions. Uh, so that would include like the Princeton's of the world. And you can see that, that the sticker price is getting you know, into nosebleed territory, $45,000 a year or so. It's pretty expensive. Um, and that's been a growth over that time of about 47%. So that's pretty high. If we look at uh, the for-profits, which are these next two lines, whether it's two-year or four-year, they haven't seen as much growth in their tuition. Uh, that's growth about 8%. The biggest percentage increase has been in the public sector, though. So the orange line reflects um, public four-year institutions. There's been a growth of about, I have my cheat sheet, about 64% uh, in tuition over time. You start from a low base and you go up, it's, uh, you know, there's going to be a big percentage increase. And then the bottom line is the increase in tuition for public two-year institutions. Um, and this is what gets reported in the news. Um, and it is, this is where we see our eye-popping numbers. What is less talked about, except for whenever you hear an economist talk about higher education, um, is a reminder that 60% of students receive financial aid. And over, uh, the, most part, the, the, the majority of that are in grant aid in terms of Fell grants or institutional grants, or tax credits are the, the latest, um, the newcomer in terms of aid that you don't have to pay back. Um, and uh, on average, students receive about $8,700 in financial aid. So just like when you buy a car and, you know, when you're, when you're shopping for the new, I don't know, Honda, and you check out the sticker price, right, any website worth its salt to say, well, you have to negotiate that price down. And on average, people in your neighborhood or your state actually pay into something less than the sticker price. Right, so the same is true with tuition. Most people don't pay the sticker price. Some people do, but most people don't. And so if you actually look at the net tuition and fees, which is what on average students are paying, the growth has been much lower and much slower. 
So the top line here, you'll, for those who are discerning, you'll notice that the time years have changed and the data source has shifted uh, because I couldn't get net tuition fees from the same source. Anyway, so that's why. I did the best I could. So this top line is the published tuition and fees, and the bottom line is when you take out uh, grants and uh, tax credits, not student loans. So I haven't factored in student loans here. So the difference between these lines gives you an idea of the amount of um, financial aid. So I hope you notice that while tuition, for example, at, at not-for-profit four-year institutions has roughly doubled over this period, net tuition has gone up much more slowly. I think that's an increase of only about 20%. There's still an increase, so I'm not trying to say there hasn't been an increase, but it's much slower than you would believe if you had read, if you were just relying on the New York Times. If we look at public four-year institutions, again, we see a big increase in the sticker price in the published tuition and fees, much slower increase uh, in, uh, once we factor in financial aid. But that said, you'll notice, well, there was a bit of a dip here, but the, you know, this sort of continues. There has certainly been an increase in tuition and fees in the publics. Uh, uh, but, uh, but the gap is widening because one of the punchlines that I'll show you in a little bit is that there has been an increase in financial aid. So it's not as easy to see and it's a little more hidden, but, that, but it is there. The big part that's maybe not as relevant, maybe some of you have been to a community college, uh, but when the college board estimates net tuition and fees for public two-year institutions, for the past several years it's been negative. Because they start from a low tuition base, and then even Pell Grants can be used to cover living expenses and other forms of aid, and when you take into tax credits, that actually it's costing students very little to go to community college. So at some level, so I, again, I'm not going to take away, we're going we're to delve into those increases even in net tuition fees. But it's really vitally important to keep in mind that in this country, we follow a bit of a system of higher sticker price but also more aggressive financial aid that's more targeted. Um, and so that the net price is really what we want to look at for most students. Some students are paying the full price, but for most students. So if we want to then say, okay, well, so, uh, okay, but we see this schools are paying, you know, tuition has been increasing, and can we understand where that's, um, why? And is it, and when we go why, if you read again the press, or in this case maybe listen to members of Congress, you would believe it's because there are lots of lazy rivers and climbing walls. Okay, President Nebraska, do you have a lazy river? So. No, yeah. you should work on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, climbing wall? Pond right there. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, you work on that. So the, you know, the narrative is that the reason why tuition has been increasing is because schools are inefficient, there are bloated bureaucracies filled with administrators who are not contributing to the education of the students, right? OK, you're laughing. Jessica's laughing. Former student, I should add. She's done pretty well, I think. Um, so, uh, but you would think that really it's not very, that it's because these institutions are just wildly inefficient, and that what we have to do is crack down and get them to become more efficient. So an e this is not you know, totally kosher, but here's, here's one way to think about what's going on. So this top line is total education general expenditures. I put it all in. Sometimes people look at just instructional expenditures, but I want to just throw it all in there. Um, between 1987 and 2015. The bottom line is the total revenue that um, the institutions get per student. So it reflects basically tuition. I want you to know, so these are in not-for-profit four years. The first thing to note is that the expenditure per student is higher than the tuition generated per student. This is also one of the dirty secrets that people don't re recognize in almost all of higher ed, which is that tuition does not full cover the full cost of education. <laughs> He's over here shaking his head, no. Um, it does not cover the full cost of educating a student. Right, so as, as expensive as tuition is, it's not the full cost. It's actually that much more expensive to educate all of you who are here. Um, uh, in the not-for-profit sector, let me just see if I can get my uh, percentages right. Um, oh yeah, okay. Um, so in 1987, this gap was, tuition covered about 47, almost 50% of the cost of educating. Now it's up to 80%. 
So the fact, now if, if it was all about climbing walls and lazy rivers, these two lines would be parallel, right? The increase, this would be much more st steeply slope, sloped and the tuition would be tracking it. The fact that this is flatter and this is steeper says basically what's going on is that the cost of covering the expenditure per student, uh, the tuition is covering a greater percentage of that cost. So a, a greater uh, proportion of the cost of educating the students is being shifted onto the students and families, and at least in terms of tuition. If we go to the public four years, it's even more exaggerated. It doesn't look like it. But here you can actually see that, and again, I have to use my cheat sheet, um, that back in 1987, tuition covered only 17% of the cost of educating a student in a public four-year institution. What's your number here? Probably half. It's about, your yeah, tuition covers half? Uh, yeah. Wow. OK. Um, because now, that's today, yeah. right? So even here today, that number is 40%. Yeah. So there's been a big increase, but it used to be a lot lower, yeah. right? And so what's the gap? Yeah, we're talking big bucks. Yeah, and we're talking big bucks, but what has, what has gone away that what, so that it's being shifted from the, what's, what's taking up the difference? Why, why is it that tuition is covering a bigger cost of the, Cost of educating. The investment of the states have been exactly. So states have been deinvesting from our um, institutions of higher education. And Put it this way: the state pays for this for this university one fourth. One fourth of our money comes from the state. To our right. Exactly. In terms of the exactly. So that is that is really why families are feeling more of of the pinch yeah. of educating um, our students is because as a public. We used to invest a lot more in our higher education system, and we're investing less. And you would agree, though, it, it varies by states. It varies, absolutely. And I, you know, with more time, I could show you pretty charts. The other truth is, in the last couple of years, on average, there's been an increase. States are starting to put a little bit more money into their higher education systems, but they're still far lagging from where they were, you know, even 10, 20 years ago. Um, okay, so I personally don't believe that this is largely a result of uh, bloated bureaucracies. I think we're shifting who's paying what. Um, that said, um, you know, we do see some increases. All right, so families are on the hook for more. How are they paying for it? Um, so one, uh, before I get to how they're paying for it, um, so, so as families and students are being asked to pay more, Another reality in the labor market is that median incomes have been relatively stagnant. So we've seen a little bit of a pickup in the last few months, year, a really tiny pickup. On average, median income has been relatively flat. So while the family, you know, the household income is not changing much, families are being asked to put out more money to pay for the tuition of their kids going to college. So here's a diagram to show that. So this is the, um, the, uh, the published tuition, the black is going to be published tuition and fees in public four-year institutions. In 2000, uh, those tuition and fees represented only about 8% of median family income. In 2017, it had doubled to 16%. Families are going to feel that. Now, who was listening? Are we supposed to look at the published tuition? No. No, OK. So. <laughs> If we look at the net tuition, <laughs> we still see that it used to be the families that net tuition covered about 3% of the median family income, but that still has doubled to 6%. So the magnitude isn't as great, but there's still families are going to feel it. And if we look at uh, not-for-profit uh, four-year institutions, you can see that uh, tuition was about 38% of net family income. Uh, median family income in 2000 is up to about 56%. And then, interestingly, it hasn't changed that much in terms of the net tuition because there's so much financial aid. But nonetheless, you know, 23% of your family income going to, um, uh, going to higher education uh, can be a challenge for some families, especially when there are other things you need to be paying for, such as rent and your cell phone and other things like that. Cell phones, which have become a necessity, let's face it. Um, so I think that this is part of the pinch, right? Is that really it's not as much about higher education as about the fact that higher education has to compete with many other demands on one's uh, paycheck, and that paycheck hasn't changed much. So the fact that higher education has changed and healthcare has changed, right? There have been other necessities that have changed. Um, it just is feeling more uncomfortable. So how are families paying? 
what these lines reflect are the percentage of the, um, how are families paying for the college education? So it's the percent allocation to uh, parent savings and tuition, savings and income, uh, you know, the percent that's due to financial aid, this is a percent that's student loans, um, and then some other stuff. Um, so there's student income and savings, uh, relatives are at the very bottom, and then parent borrowing. So the black line shows you, and I always kill myself in these uh, the black line shows you that there's been a decrease in uh, how much families are actually using their own savings and income to pay for higher education. Whereas back in 2009, it was about just over 35% of how a family was paying. It's down to just over 20%, you know, about 22%. So that has been a decrease. The decrease during the recession doesn't surprise me because many families lost wealth and they had to use their savings because there was great unemployment. Uh, many people lost their houses. Uh, but then you saw a, a pickup. The, la the decrease in the last couple of years is more surprising to me, and I don't understand what's beneath that, except for the fact that we've also seen that more financial aid is available, so there's not as great of an incentive to be saving to pay for higher ed. So that may be part of it, I'm not sure. Um, notice student loans. There has certainly been a pickup. There, you know, it's been ebbing and flowing with a pickup, uh, particularly in between 2016 and 2017. Uh, but my, in my takeaway from this, what I really see is that families are paying a little bit less, but we see a big pickup in terms of financial aid. So student loans, you'll notice this. As a fraction, student loans have only hovered around 15% or so of, the, of how families are paying for financial aid. So why is it that we're all focused on student loans? Well, one, there has been a bit of an increase over time. And two, just the magnitude uh, is starting to become eye-popping, right? I think there's the statistic is that if we look at the total amount of student loan debt that's out there, it's like $1.4 trillion. Um, and if we look at that as a percentage of household debt, it's about 11%, whereas, whereas it was only represented about 3% about uh, 20 years ago. So let's talk a little bit about student debt. These two pie charts show you the distribution of borrowers versus debt. Uh, in 2014. If everybody, if everybody borrowed in equal amounts across all different levels and all different types of institutions, the pie charts would reflect that first slide I showed you with the distribution of students across the sectors. <coughs> so the first thing that caught my eye is what fraction of all students are represented in the for-profit sector? 5%. And look at that, they're 25% of the borrowers. So when we think about, in terms of just borrowers, these guys are disproportionate. If we look at graduate school, they represent about 5%. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about the rest, actually, for the time being. If we look at the amount of debt, however, you can see that the, the students at for-profit are not taking out dollar for dollar, so their loans are a little bit smaller. But look at the graduate school debt. It's 10% of the total debt which tells you that the amount that the graduate students are taking out is quite large. So I want to just ponder that for a minute, um, because if you read the newspaper, you think that everybody's got student loan debts that are greater than $50,000, $85,000, uh, these eye-popping numbers. In reality, that is represented by our graduate student, stu graduate student debt. So if we look at the share of borrowers who have balances over 50,000, this is adult, uh, borrowers uh, who have started uh, re in repayment. In 2000, it was about 9%. That did double to 18%. But if you look at among those who are undergraduate, it was only 2% in 2000. It's just, five, it's just 6% now. Now, that's tripled. I'm not going to say we shouldn't pay attention. But that, ca that pales in comparison to the 42% of the borrowers who have a balances over $5,000 um, are in graduate school. If we look at the share of borrowers that have over 100K, um, that's 9.1% 9, 9 of borrowers, uh, and most of those are in the graduate, are in graduate school. Would graduate school include professional schools? Yes. So that's, we're talking medical school, law school, exactly. So the fact that NYU has announced that it is no longer going to be charging tuition, there was a little bit of fine print there, but you know, their tuition is, their tuition is $53,000 a year, that's actually a big deal. Now the other reality is that students who take out graduate student loan debt are actually able to repay it. That's the other part that doesn't go along with the New York Times article. 
um, because they make enough in order to be able to repay it. So that's not where the default problem lies. So what's, re what's really going on is um, uh, the default problems are in our students taking out smaller amounts of loans um, in other sectors. So this is a chart that shows you loan repayment rate seven years after entering repayment. So by loan repayment, what we mean is that the student has taken out, has started to pay down at least one dollar of the loan principal. So first they have to pay interest, then they get to the principal. So it doesn't seem like a high bar, but it's actually meaningful because that means that they're going to start spending down their debt. Because I didn't put a chart here, but there's an increasing number of people who actually have their loan, uh, what they owe, growing over time because they're not actually getting to starting to pay down the principal. Um, and so this chart just is going to highlight one fact or two facts. One is it's w the, so this is repayment rate. They've started to repay seven years after entering. For public institutions and not-for-profits, you see that among those who have completed any degree or credential in either one of those sectors, about 80% have started to repay within seven years. That's pretty good compared to only 50% of those in the for-profit for sector. Um, and then this chart also highlights the importance of completion. So for those students who don't have any credential or degree after starting, um, only 50, 60% of those, even in the public institutions and, and not-for-profit institutions, have started repaying, and only a third of those who are in for-profit institutions. So this is part of the reason why many people, as they start to think about how to tackle our student loan repayment problem, um, want to focus on completion. Because what happens is students have taken out even small amounts of debt. If they don't complete, they're not earning enough to repay. I think it's actually more than just not earning enough, because I think a lot of students actually are, because they're not taking out that much in loan debt. I think they're not getting the information that they need about different repayment options and what their obligations are. I think this is, I think student loans, like any other kinds of financial instruments, are very complicated. And I think students don't really know what they're getting into and what their options are. I think there was recent news about many students who are eligible for some of these loan forgiveness programs were not told about that. Um, and so I think that's part of it as well. Nonetheless, I think this is part of the reason why many people are concerned. Okay. So um, before I turn to the benefits, this is my takeaway on the costs which is that tuition, uh, the published tuition has indeed been rising rather steeply over the past almost 20 years. Net tuition has been increasing much, much more slowly because we've seen very aggressive increases in financial aid, especially over the last five, six years, seven years. Um, nonetheless, the reason why we're seeing some ajida in the, you know, among the community um, is because even the, the, the smaller increases in net tuition are representing a bigger fraction of family income. So the families are having to make harder choices about whether to go to college and whether to send their kids to college or not. But as economists, we can't just look at the cost side and make an investment decision. We have to look at the benefits as well. So let's do that. Um, so this is a chart that has been the foundation of not one, but two Nobel Prizes in economics. Uh, and today is Economics Prize Day, so, but to, it was about in the environment today, so whatever. Um, not nearly as important as education. <laughs> you know, that little thing that we worry about called climate change, just small. Um, but uh, both Gary Becker and Mike Spence won um, Nobel Prizes for trying to understand whence this relationship. It is one of the few relationships on which you can get economists to agree. So we celebrate that. <laughs> the reasons why I think we're also coming to understand that we actually think there is value added to um, uh, institutions of learning. Some of it may be ability bias or self-selection, meaning the students who get more schooling probably would have done well whether they went to school or not. But I think many of us, including James Hepman, have come to believe that a lot of it is due to the schooling itself. And what this chart shows you is it's, it's graphing annual income against years of school completed. 11 years would be someone who drops out in their junior year of high school. And you can see it's fairly linear from there on out. So that for almost every year of post-secondary schooling, you're going to see a, a similar kind of increase in earnings. Um, and roughly speaking, that increase is about 10% per year. Some numbers are a little higher. Some are smart, sl slightly s smaller. Uh, but on average, it's about 10% per year. So that's all well and good. But maybe the reason why people are thinking that the, the, the investment in schooling isn't as worth it is that there's more risk associated with it. OK, so that's what I want to 
poke out a little bit more? And have there been changes in what that risk might look like? Um, so uh, one way to think about the risk is what's your likelihood of getting a job at all? When I was working in the Obama administration, it was in the height of the recession, and I heard lots of people complaining, I went to college and then didn't get a job. OK, well, that's always going to be true. Investing in higher education is like any other investment. There's some risk associated. But if you think that was risky, you should try the alternative of not going to school at all. Right? So uh, this chart reflects that. Even during the height of the recession, the proportions were relatively the same. That the unemployment rate for those with a bachelor's degree or higher was roughly half that of those who either had just a high school diploma or had dropped out of high school. And so as you can see, that having more schooling is protective against unemployment. Right? The more schooling you have, the less likely you are going to be unemployed. It's still at about 2%. Doesn't mean it's zero. You're not guaranteed a job. But it's much lower than it would have been without the college degree. OK. The other complaint and aspect of risk that I've heard is people saying, fine. My son, daughter, you know, nephew got a job, but they're underemployed, meaning they have a job that they didn't need to go to school to get. OK, so how are we going to think about that? So the New York Fed has went through and they categorized jobs um, by whether 50% of the people who are in those jobs say that a college degree is required or not. So um, if 50% uh, if or more said a college degree was required, it was categorized as a job that was appropriate. Otherwise, it's going to consider, if you're in a job where less than 50% reported you need a college degree, we're going to call that underemployed. So what fraction of college graduates are working in a job that doesn't really require a BA? And you can see, the, and then the black lines are those who are recent graduates, so they're ages 22 to 27. And then the orange lines are uh, graduates, so that's ages 22 to 65. So the fact that the recent graduates are more likely to be in a job that doesn't require a BA is because it's called, a, what do we call it, an entry level job. Um, and so that, is, that has been true. That has been a feature of our labor market for decades. The difference between the, uh, having a bachelor's degree or not is the growth, is the occupational growth. And the fact that the black lines are greater than the orange lines reflects the fact that as you get older, you're less likely to be underemployed like that. So I, I looked at this chart and I said, you know what, at least compared to the last 30 years or so, 20 years, um, uh, you know, re even recent graduates are not, no more, no less likely to be underemployed than before. So I don't think that is adequately capturing the risk. But there's another way to think about it. Are those good paying jobs? Because we're, again, we've got to worry about our investment, which is not just do you have a job, but are you getting a good job and how we think about that. So the New York Fed also characterized, um, categorized the jobs so into whether they pay well or not. So this is only looking at people who are underemployed, so those college graduates who have a job that doesn't require a college degree. And the black lines reflect those that are in what we would call a good wage job, meaning that they pay $45,000 a year or more. And the orange lines reflect low wage jobs that they pay less than $25,000 a year. So you can see that even among you know, most, even most college graduates, even if they're underemployed, a lot of them are in pretty good paying jobs. But look at the change over time. What we can see is that there's been an increasing, I see Ukraine. There's an increasing proportion of um, recent graduates that are in the low wage jobs, and a decreasing proportion that are in uh, decent paying jobs. So I think again, this is part of the um, the the concern that people have about college, the perception that it's riskier, which is that over time it has become a little bit riskier. You're not as guaranteed to ha get a good job. You're just, you know, you're likely to be employed, but you're not as likely to get a good paying job. And if you combine that with an increase in the loans, the whole proposition is starting to look a little bit riskier. So um, uh, Doug Weber tried to roll all this up. So the first question is, OK, over a lifetime, do, you know, will you earn more if you go to college and graduate than if you don't? And the average college gra graduate can expect to earn about $900,000 more than the typical high school graduate. OK, that's well and good. But what about this risk you were just talking about? So he tried to build in some notions of risk as well. And so one statistic that he comes up with is that what's the likelihood that over your lifetime you will earn more than $2 million a year? 
And if you've got a bachelor's degree, you've got a 60% chance of earning more than $2 million a year. If you have a high school degree only, you've only got a 7% chance. But I hear you cry, but many people don't graduate. So even for those who don't finish a degree, about 78% of them will earn uh, enough that college look like it's a good investment, as long as they're not paying anything for that. Okay, so everybody pays a little bit of something unless you went to a two-year college, but then you don't have a college degree. Um, it's only when they're paying on average $50,000 a year or more that college doesn't look like a, that it's a worthwhile investment, that it's a, it's a coin to flip, that your 50% chance you're gonna make, you're gonna, it will have been worthwhile, 50% chance not so much, in which case you're sort of ambivalent, but no one's paying $50,000 a year to go to college. Um, especially among those who can afford it. So I think that's my way of saying that even if you don't complete, it's still a worthwhile investment. That's from the individual point of view. I am mindful of the fact that we might want to have a few questions. So I'm going to zip through the fact that, so when we, when we economists think about the economic benefit, there is the benefit to the individual, which I have highlighted, but there's also the externality, which is the benefit to society. So let me just highlight a few of those. So first, if you make more money, you can pay more in taxes. So what we have here is that those with more schooling pay more in federal income taxes, state income tax, local income taxes, property taxes, um, and the like. Um, and so uh, they're more likely to give back in terms of tax revenue. We can see there's an inverse relationship between schooling and dependence on social assistance, whether that be in the form of the, you know, school lunch program, Medicaid, SNAP, housing assistance. So again, this is completely related to the success in the labor market. More likely to be civically involved. So those who have more schooling are more likely to have volunteered, um, uh, more like volunteered in the last year and more likely to have voted in the 2014 election. And we all know it's important to get out there and vote. Coming up in November, get out there and vote. Um, there is also some evidence. <laughs> That's economic. No, I put my political science hat on now. <laughs> uh, and dean of the Woodrow Wilson School of Public Policy. <laughs> Whatever your politics, vote. Um, so, uh, and then there's some evidence that uh, people with more schooling are also healthier. An unappreciated contribution of our colleges and universities, especially our research universities, is innovation. When we think about the foundations of economic growth, innovation is very much among them. And you know, whether it comes to technology in our smartphones, the invention of the internet, uh, you know, current brain research, cancer drugs, the invention of Google in a variety of areas, the basic science that was done was done at our, um, at our, at our colleges and universities. We're just wrapping up Nobel Week, Nobel Prize Week, and I think that's just a reminder of all of the great things and the innovation that has come from our institutions. And that is a very important public benefit, which I have not seen anybody try to tally up, uh, but we know that is very, very important. So to wrap up, this is a wordy final slide. <laughs> uh, but again, you know, yes, we've seen some of the costs increasing, but even even with the Great Recession and, and in today's economy, even though the risks may have increased slightly, it does still appear, appear that the ROI on higher education is still positive. It's still one of the best investments that a young person um, can make. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't need to be more vigilant, especially about uh, taking out student loans. Uh, just as one has to think twice about taking out a car loan or a housing mortgage or taking out loans in any other place, a student loan also should only be taken out very intentionally. And so I think that efforts to better understand which institutions are trying to do right by their students and which are not um, is very important. And it's also very important for students to understand what they're signing on for. Uh, but I do believe, in my own humble opinion, that while we need to hold institutions accountable, uh, by reading the press, you would think that the student loan crisis is much bigger than I believe it is. I think it's an important financial aid tool. But it is one that should be used very wisely. Um, but I do believe it's a tool that, because it does help increase access and allow students um, the opportunity to invest in themselves in human capital. With that, I'm happy to take some questions.
Thank you, Deacon Myers, for getting her here. Uh -huh. I have been inviting her for some time, and she's been <laughs> promising she would come, and she did come. And <laughs> That's kind of true. Of that. And I'm especially <laughs> appreciative that she's getting a chance to see the quality of our students and to look at ways we might partner, Princeton, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. Here's my question. Uh, the, the media continue, will continue to talk about uh, the public not thinking as much about education, going in a different direction. But I'm always thinking about actions versus words. Yes. And so I took advantage of Google while you were mm -hmm. sitting there. And look, in 2000, there were 13 million people uh -huh. in higher education. Um, it went up to 18 million in 2010. Mm -hmm. It's down slightly, 16.9, yep. but, but will go up another 3% to about 17.5 in the next few years, which says to me that the vast majority of people are continuing, particularly those who are educated, yes. to understand it is the best thing. So how do you reconcile this, this overemphasis from the polls and everything, and everybody's not believing in it, but parents and others and send their kids and families send their loved ones to college knowing from their own experiences that it makes a difference. What's the, what's, what's wrong? So that's what I'm trying to, I mean, honestly, I'm trying to figure that out. I do, I, what I, I actually think that this increase in the riskiness is somehow related to where some of the Ajita is coming from. Because I, I know I don't necessarily see it per se, but it, you know when you think about all of the different institutions, not all the public institutions are as fabulous as UMBC, right? And for many, was that, a, was that a was that a gratuitous shout out to you? She really does say that in New York. She said that in New No, but, but I, I say that sincerely. And so this is where I also think that the for-profit sector has not helped us. Let me, let me just say, and just you can, and I, from chairing that Obama commission, we looked at the data and what yeah. you just said. And what's so troubling about the for-profit sector is that they are masterful in advertising on TV mm -hmm. and pulling at your heartstrings. And people who are from first generation college yep. families, low income, minority, believe them, go there. And while the 30% is overall, I mean, the biggest of all, Universal Phoenix has under 20% graduation rate. Right? Exactly. And big debt, not like community Yeah, college, exactly. Right? Exactly. So and um, so it's been a sector that's been hard for us to really understand the economic benefits or returns from. But every study that I see that's starting to look at it finds that there's no return. And especially when you compare that to a community college where the tuition is, uh, I think it, in the for-profits, it's two and a half times that in a community college. Um, you know, a lot of students don't complete community college either, but they have not taken on nearly the amount of debt in order to do so. And there's typically more of an economic benefit for having, going, for having gone. So um, I think the for-profits are not helping us in this realm. Um, and then I think that families, really, if you look at the, the fact that median family income has not changed, healthcare costs have gone up, high rate costs have gone up. I think other, you know, we haven't seen a lot of inflation, but healthcare and education in particular, I think that they are actually feeling more stressed. Will you, final question for me. Will you think that the, um, the rise in certificates and badges that are connected to agencies and companies will have an impact on either people wanting to graduate or not. You know, I told you about our training company, you can get a certificate, yeah. make $80,000. A lot of people will do that, and a bachelor's, some will just do that. Yeah. Will that, do you see that trend? You know, I don't know. So actually, one of the things I did uh, that I actually started under Clinton, I'd forgotten, and then we picked it up again under Obama, and I don't, it didn't get very far, is we don't have good data on these kinds of credentials. Yeah. And it turns out it's really hard to ask the question so that you could add it to the American Community Survey or the current population survey. Because there are so many ways in which we use the word credential or certificate that it's hard for, in a, res in a survey, for respondents to distinguish them. So we actually don't know very much about the economic benefit to these, to these kinds of um, you know, sub-baccalaureate degrees. I want to say two things. First of all, the question I would like to see an answer to that I have never seen is, are you going to send your child to college? That's all I want to know. Oh, you know what? Actually, I think some of these, I have seen it juxtaposed because uh, you know, President Hebrowski is absolutely right that the same ones that say it's headed in the wrong way are, want to send their own kids to school. So I have seen that. All right, now the other thing is that if you look at the history of higher education, there are always critics for various reasons. The first half century and the 20th century, um, colleges were atheistic. I went to the University of Minnesota after that time, and as a graduate student, and the kids told me that 
where in Minnesota they lived outside the big city, everybody thought atheists were teaching at the University of Minnesota. Then around 1960, it was communists, right? And during your time, the higher education was filled with communists and legislators and the kind of congressmen complained over and over again that communists were die, dominating higher education. So I see the the criticism changes, but oh, still. Okay, so I do have a bonus slide. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the data that has just come out <coughs> on, now it's Democrats, right? So this is the number of Democratic faculty members for every Republican. Um, so you're, you're right, uh, this, is the, this is the concern. Um, I, I first got onto this, Cass Sunstein had a blog saying really the higher education does have, you know, is too liberal. Um, uh, I, I have to say that I dug into one, wait, so I can't see it. So in this group of universities, so they, I think it's a group of 50 universities or something that they surveyed or that they got up data on, uh, included West Point and maybe the Naval Academy, two military academies. And they said even there, there was not, like the, the number of Democrats dominated the number of Republicans. But I actually look, so these are actually the numbers of PhD holding faculty. And at, for example, the military academies, the one that I looked up, I think it was West Point, only a third of the faculty had a PhD. So they would not have captured actually all of the faculty. So you always have to ask questions about what, you know, the, what the data actually represent. But anyway, so that's your new communist. It's now <laughs> being a Democrat. Um, uh, so I think that's a fair point, but two things that do concern me where they actually have done actions. One is the tax on um, the wealthiest universities. So Princeton is among them. So it's 30 institutions that are subjected to this. It's a 1.4% tax on the endowments. And it hasn't been well defined, whether it's the return on the endowment, what it is. Um, so you know, quite frankly, from Princeton's perspective, it's not going to cripple it right away. It will slow its growth and new programs, et cetera, because it's trimming some of the growth off of the endowment. But more importantly, it becomes the uh, camel's nose under the tent. So Congress looks looking for revenue. You know, you can increase that 1.4 to 2.0. You can decrease the number of students per dollar in the endowment so that it sweeps in more institutions and state and local governments can start taxing. So that, that will become, at some point, it will become crippling for uh, not-for-profits that have endowments. But two, the increase in accountability, I am all in favor of accountability, but the way that it's being implemented and the way that it's being spread to all sectors of higher ed, I worry about that. Because it's, what started is this gameful employment rule, which was meant to look at whether students in programs that are occupationally focused are actually getting, uh, getting an economic benefit from having gone, is now, now there's a big effort to spread it to all liberal arts, all kinds of institutions. And there, I think, we don't know what the outcome is uh, for all of these institutions. And furthermore, I don't know that we all think that the, the, the economic, um, you know, what the economic proposition is necessarily within five or 10 years even per se. And so I do worry that part of what is great in our institutions of higher education, some of this innovation doesn't happen right away. Some of it can't be monetized right away. And so if we are gonna start to put on these metrics I worry that we're going to start to narrow the scope of our higher education system. So I do worry that there is some action that is actually coming behind these words these days. So you said that tuition has gone up a lot, but it's mostly been covered by financial aid. So is there a reason that they keep going up so much instead of just stabilizing if they mostly just cancel each other out? Um, so first of all, it's not the same people doing the same things, okay, yeah, right? So the financial aid may be coming from the feds, whereas the tuition revenue is going to go state to the public institution that's more state. Um, um, and so, you know, a question that I often get is, well, in other countries, the state pays for college, and so students don't have to pay for anything. So that's a version of keep the tuition really low, <laughs> and everybody has a subsidy. Um, so as an economist, I think that's rather inefficient. Um, you know, Bill Gates's kids don't really need any tuition benefit. Actually, quite frankly, mine don't either. Um, and so, uh, why should we do that? I would it should charge me the full price and then use the difference to subsidize somebody who can't um, 
uh, who can't pay for quite as much. We can get more people into college that way than if we just kept the price low for everybody. Um, and what you do see in a lot of these other countries is that there's tracking early on. Um, and so if you're, you know, in Germany, if you haven't gotten it together by the time you're what, like 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, you're, you ha there's, you, you, there are ways to second chance, but they're pretty rare. And so I, I think that that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the way we're going. So um, thank you so much for giving this talk. It was really interesting. Um, so my question has to do with sort of how does the investment of education differ between race and ethnicity? Do we find that like certain races bear like greater debt, um, or do certain races or ethnicities um, benefit more from higher education? So um, I've done a little bit of work on looking at whether the return to schooling differs by race. Um, haven't found it, um, but. I, I, you know, I, by the time we've dealt with self-selection and measurement error, I, I managed to do this in, the, in a small data set where I was looking at siblings. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of small. Um, if we just use the, and if we use just cross-sectional surveys like the current population survey, there's some variation, but not meaningful. Um, there are differences in terms of race, in terms of what kinds of institutions. African Americans are more likely to go to for-profits for example, um, because, for example, some of the reasons that uh, President Hrabowski was saying that, you know, they're, they've come from poor, more disadvantaged families, um, they may not have had the great quality schooling, and so they're, they're not ready for a four-year institution in terms of entrance exams or, or even passing remedial, um, through remedial classes, um, and the for-profits are willing to take them, and so they're taking on more debt. So it doesn't cut evenly in terms of those kinds of burdens. Um, but you know, the poorer your family, the more like eligible are for Pell Grants and other forms of aid as well. But they, I do think, you know, for blacks, I think we're more likely to have uh, loan debt and to be in the for-profits, which is not such a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, my question might be a little wonkish. Um, what I observe here is discriminant pricing between the actual tuition, right? The, you know, sort of like the after-tax income, the after-financial yep. aid tuition expense, and the overall distribution of income in the United States, which the variability, the overall variance of that income has increased dramatically, so discriminative pricing sort of captures that increase. Has anybody looked at that? You know? I haven't seen it explicitly in that term. I mean, I, I think many people have described it in the way that I did, which is we're following this high tuition, high financial aid model. Um, but I don't know that I've seen anybody literally tie in the tuition increases and increase in financial aid to increasing income inequality. There you go. New research project. Hi. Um, my question goes back to one of the slides. I think that 23% of the, uh, I guess, the family income going towards higher education. Um, I guess the first part is, like, where do you see that, I guess, moving forward, forecast it in the next 10 years? Or is that, I, that's definitely not ideal, I guess. You know, what's not ideal? The 23% over. Do you think it should be more or less? Uh, I think it should be, I guess, well, it increased, right? I think I have, so th these data only go back to, I think, about 2009. <coughs> I think if we go back further, families used to pay a greater percentage. Okay. So is that a good or bad thing? I was having a long conversation with my good friend who feels she's being penalized for having saved for her son's college because now he's not eligible for financial aid. Um, you know, I think it really depends on whether you believe that there's a private return versus a, you know, the public return. So my question is actually, um, so a lot of people talk about there's a bunch of job opportunity and this, all this job growth and a lot of students look at that data they make big majors or their future careers based solely on that data. And then suddenly, um, I guess as soon as they achieve that, there's an abundance of data on underqualification for a job. Um, but then you have situations where students may find themselves overqualified for a job. And pretty much, um, of course, it varies from locality to locality, but is there like a study on, I guess, overqualifications based on that? OK, so I think that's what I showed you. Right, the percentage of recent graduates that were in jobs that didn't actually require a bachelor's degree. Or are you referring to you don't get the job because you're overqualified? Yeah, you're pretty much overqualified. Yeah, no, the unemployment rate for those with a bachelor's degree is 2.2 percent. They got a job. 
right? So they're not being turned away because they're overqualified. But there is a fraction um, that is in jobs where they may not have needed the bachelor's degree, but they got the job. Um, and then there's a problem that some of them are not being paid well in those jobs. But they got the job. Right, see that? Yeah, come on, people like, they got the job. <laughs> oh wait, I've already asked, you've already asked a question. So this is maybe related to the, to the full take question. Do you have data on the impact of the college savings accounts and how that contributes to this overall mix? Was that the line that was the personal savings? Yeah, I think that would count as personal savings. Um, and so, do you know of the people who are paying the full tuition price? How many of those use college savings? Yeah, I don't. That's a good question. I don't. The, you know, the, yeah. If you start saving from the beginning, then potentially there is a half subsidy. of the total yeah. amount in the account could have come from yep. a tax subsidy. Yep. Yeah. Tax-free. Yep. Um, savings. savings. Yep. So even those who feel like. They're getting nothing. Yes, getting they actually got something. Yeah. Very good point. I have not seen data on that. Okay. okay, one last question. You mentioned that 5% of the debtors were graduate students who those in grad school. Yes. And that was 10% of the total debt. Is yes. That, that was correct. Is that debt just accrued in graduate school or yes. because that, that debt is independent to graduate school? Is there any data or anything you found to support the difference between graduate, graduate school continuing at the same uh, university as the undergraduate? Or you know, going out of state, is there any disparity? You know, someone is looking to go to grad school out of state. <laughs> I'm worried about that you know, out of state uh, tuition price relative to in state. For graduate school, what kind of graduate school? Uh, economics. <laughs> yeah. A little close to home. PhD. Uh, master's, PhD, or master's or PhD. It depends. Exactly. There's a huge right. difference because typically, <laughs> so because typically, if you go into a PhD program, you're going to have your way paid for. Okay. If you go into a master's program, often those are revenue generators, right? right? So it, that actually makes a difference in terms of how we think about it. So go for the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>